The Angry Marks Podcast Network is brought to you by WrestleWork, a social network to connect, create, and share everything about pro wrestling. Check it out today at WrestleWork.com. You're listening to the Angry Marks Podcast Network. I've always thought you were one of the best big guys in wrestling. You've got an incredible amount of talent that has not been used, in my opinion. Could have been put with the likes of Big Show and Kane and stuff like that and develop feuds to make you the next, you know, big monster. Instead, they give you the stuttering gimmick and you're gone. So, well, you know what? The other part of that is the other part of that is it it takes two to tango. Not not Kane because I never got to work with him, but but Big Show, for instance, and other big guys. They've also got to be willing to be able to be cool with that, ready to happen. You see what I'm saying? Unfortunately, the office still listens to those big guys when it comes time for that situation to happen. The fact that it hasn't, and there's been so many other big guys that could have been that guy, it, it is disgusting. And it's why you don't see any big, real big dudes up there. Right now you've got uh, the guy with the beard, I forget his name, Eric Rowan, you know, but that's really it. And, and right. no disrespect to him, I would wrestle and talk circles around that guy. Yep, um, absolutely. That's just because I'm, I'm, I'm a more seasoned than him, though. I'm not saying it to put him down. Um, I'm just saying because that's the truth. Um, but it doesn't matter. It, you have to be able to do it in a non-threatening way, and I'm sure he's doing it exactly in that way where a big show and the other guys don't feel threatened by him. And that's the whole other part of the politics game you've got to be able to play. You know what I mean? You've got to be able to come up. They want you to do well as a big guy, but those type of guys don't want you to do too well. It's hard to understand, guys. Yeah. It's hard to explain. Well, it's not like, man, it's not like you're the giant Silva or giant Gonzalez who had absolutely zero talent. That's you're obviously and, 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 a talented and, 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 and big man lies, that, that that they could have worked with. Let me, let, 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 me let me finish. Therein lies the problem, though. You just answered your own question. You're right. I'm not. I'm, a, I'm athletic. Uh, I can speak. I, I could put sentences together, as Jim Lott said. Um, I'm a Magna Cum Laude graduate. Sometimes too smart for my own good. And um, that puts a bigger target on your back, you know? And uh, that's why when I went to TNA, it was night and day different. They weren't. They weren't scared by it. They Vince Vince Russo just blew more flames on it. If anything, he fanned more flames on it and let me be myself uh, versus trying to make me, you know, a dummy down version of myself. So so WWE releases you 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 work with you know some in New Japan for a little while and then you finally back in the states with the, and you get hooked up with TNA. So how did you get? With them, did they seek you out? Did you seek them? Jim Cornette, uh, Jim work? Cornette, Jim Cornette. Can, can you guys hear me or no? Yes, absolutely. When you guys are talking, can you hear? When I okay, I just make sure I'm not cutting you off. Um, Jim Cornette was um, there at the time, um, working uh, with Jeff Jarrett and Dutch, uh, Dutch Mantel, two very good friends of his. And uh, you know, I sat down with Jeff Jarrett a couple times, and we were talking about a time for me to start working there, but they didn't really have a TV deal sealed at Spike at the moment. And, um, you know, he wanted when I came in to, to do something with Cornette, somebody I'm comfortable with, let me do everything in my power to, 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 to be in situations where I spoke on the mic and covered my body. So I, I wouldn't rely on my physique and rely on my size. And more importantly, the fans see me a little bit differently as far as, okay, he's definitely not that stuttering character he played in WWE. He's not a big goof. He actually can talk. And then once we get to that point, then let's take the suit off, let's get him in a ring, and then let's make him the monster we know he can be. And they did exactly that to the T. They gave me almost, what, like a six-month run? I want to say at least uh, being Jim Cornette's bodyguard, so to speak, where I was also somehow being the general manager of the show when he wasn't there and ruining the show and things like that, but giving golden opportunities to host the show and speak. You don't get to see seven-footers do very often. And uh, I just think it was a good marriage, and it made perfect sense. Even though I, I remember in the beginning, I didn't necessarily agree with it because I was so eager to want to prove everybody wrong and go like, look, I can work, I can wrestle, I can do it all. Let me just get in the ring and do it. Well, again, what would have happened is I just would have been labeled another big guy versus getting an opportunity to speak and maybe maybe uh, change fans' perceptions of me that, you know, what he can actually be he's a pretty good talker kind of a thing. That was the goal, at least. And then rely on that first and foremost. So by the time it came time to the wrestling end, well, then you, you put two and two together. The guy's big, he's jack, he's athletic. We get that. But on top of it, he can talk. This is, you know, that was the goal. You know, the cool thing about you, Matt, is you've had uh, the, I don't know if it's a privilege or not. You'll, you'll tell me if it was a privilege or not. 
of working with uh, in managerial slash mentor roles, Jim Cornette, Rick Flair, Paul Heyman. Who is your favorite to work with? Why? Oh, man, I, if, if I could have done it again, it, I mean, I would have asked a thousand different questions to Paul Heyman um, because I, I was so green when I was working with Paul, you know. I was rushed up to TV super quick, tagged with Nathan Jones, and between the two of us, even though he had more experience, I was the one that was, I, was not, I don't want to say smarter, but had more savvy um, between the two of us. So he would be more of the killer to my more cerebral giant, if you will. Um, but I didn't have enough time up there to get what I would have liked to have gotten out of working with Paul by asking questions and having him help me because he was responsible for not just me, but me, Nathan, Brock, A-Train, Big Show. We were all teamed together for a while there. Um, as part of Team Lesnar, the biggest team in Survivor Series history, right? So right. We, that just that just wasn't one on a one off pay per view, you know. That was something that was there for a few months um, before Nathan Jones quit, you know. So, I mean, definitely Jim Cornette, just simply because I've spent more time with Jim. Jim, you know, helped coach me in developmental. And then here I'm working with him on TNA, and he got me out of a lot of scenarios where they were ready to pull me out of this suit prematurely and uh the writing team was ready to put me in the ring just for no rhyme or reason and jim did everything in his power to try to make sure that that didn't happen and he really looked out for me so i can never ever repay jim Cornette enough this is the undisputed wrestling show blueprint matt morgan is our guest you know during your time in tna it seems like you spent the vast majority of the years working in some capacity with sean hernandez and we've had sean on as you're well aware of last year and he mm -hmm. cited you as being incredibly instrumental in his career, one of your very favorite people that he's ever worked with. Um, what what do you see? What did you see in in Hernandez? And I kind of saw you both, in my opinion, in the same light. Two incredibly gifted big men who weren't getting their due. What was you guys' feelings? Were you on the same page on this, or where yeah. does that lead yeah. you guys? Sean and I are a little different. Um, obviously, I'm seven feet. I'm three hundred pounds. Um, and ironically, though, Sean, the things I try to do to make myself different from, you know, show or, or any other big giants that are seven feet was um, to do a bit more athletic type things, you know, not just rely on the strength end of it. Because I always thought the strength end of it was a given, you know. I come out to my, you know, I come out for my entrance music, let's say. I look strong. It's already been established, right? With two, two seconds, you look at me. This guy must be strong. So I didn't do too many big power moves. Whereas, ironically, Hernandez, who was, you know, much shorter than me, but super strong, he would do a good chunk of our strength moves as a tag team. He's stronger than hell. That guy's one of the strongest guys I've ever been in the ring with, if not the. And I've been in the ring with Mark Henry. Um, Mark, Sean, Sean Hernandez is super strong. So, like, we, but yet he's also uber athletic as well, much like myself. Like, we both would always try to outdo each other, but in a positive, competitive way. You know what I mean? Not being jealous of one another. Um, and then when the time would come for us to go our separate ways and they would pull me in one direction and Sean in the other, we would root for each other, you know, we'd try to look each other out, have each other's back politically um, and things like that. You know, Sean, Sean's a good friend of mine and uh, a guy who I thought deserved a lot better than he got toward the end, you know. Um, Sean, you know, he's a guy that you, you don't, he doesn't have to say much. You know, I remember sometimes the knock would be, oh, Sean's not a talker. So what? He doesn't have to be a talker when you look like that and you rest and you, and you work like that, you know? You know, Sean is the king of the midget tossers, I call it. You know, I don't know if you remember, but Sean, <laughs> when you do the X Division, with, like, Sean is at his best, in my opinion, when he's tagging with a homicide. A guy right. who's taller than, a guy he's way thousands of times bigger than, right? And let him come in and just midget toss all night. I mean, it was impressive. <laughs> and then on top of it, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd chuck five X Division dudes out of the ring or over the cage or out of the galaxy. And then like two seconds later, he's jumping on top of him, jumping over the top rope. Like that's impressive. Huh. And that's how you play to Sean's strength, you know, and that's how Sean became a star. And you don't, I think sometimes they try to get a little too cute with Sean and send him this, you know, send them over to Mexico and say, Hey, we want you to become a little bit more bilingual and speak Spanish more. Okay. He goes and does that. He comes back. He's speaking a little bit better Spanish and they do nothing with it. You know, so that that I'd be frustrated for him. So when the when Matt, they, it seem, it just seems to me like in, in Sean's case and in your case, 
wasted opportunities with you guys. I mean, all the talent in the world, they didn't give you guys terrible amount of times to talk. You had all that time. You decided to take time off of television for a while. I guess tell us a little bit about your mindset, what made you you decide to leave and then show up back in Bethlehem, I guess, whatever, in a house show and mm-hmm. go on the attack. Well, really, honestly, well, Eric Bischoff came up to me one day, and he was right. I had, at this point, I had found some statistics that I had wrestled, like, the fifth most TV matches in TNA history. And I'd only been there at this time, I want to say, like, <laughs> five years, if that, right? And, I, and when you're a guy my size, you could kill yourself with overexposure. Right, a guy like me should be special. Should come out. I'm not saying like back in the '80s, like once, like once in a while, like Andre, but a little bit less than I was. You know, I shouldn't be overly exposed to wrestling too many matches. You would think, right? Because then I'm not special. And I think a lot of that's true because whenever I meet fans, they're like, "You're way bigger in person." And I'm like, "Hmm, what's going? You know, what's going on? Do I need to start working out harder in the gym? Do I need to change my physique? Why do people always say that to me?" And I think it becomes because one, I move differently than other guys my size, right? Then two, more importantly, overexposure. You know, I just think like Big Show right now, same thing. I think we're so used to seeing him that people really get lost in this dude is every bit of seven foot whatever. He's enormous. Um, but anyways, I think that has a lot to do with it, overexposure. And Eric came up to me and he's like, we're thinking of uh, taking you off TV for a bit. How do you feel before we go ahead with this? And, and I told him, I think it's a decent idea. Um, as long as I get paid, that's all I cared about. I got paid to, to get off TV for a little bit. And when the time was right, bring me back and have something fresh and new for me. Talking to Dixie, she was like, we want you to be our version of Undertaker. And I was like, like, what do you mean by that? Like, I'm going to have special powers and shit like that? And she and, and kind of made, a, made a, I made a joke of it. I'm like, what do you, you don't mean exactly like him, obviously, right? And they're like, she's like, no, but like special. And I was like, cool, this makes sense. Everyone's on the same team. Uh, everyone's on the same page. This this is great, you know? So in the meantime, for whatever rhyme or reason, because I had been off TV for about, what, three months or four months or whatever the hell it was, people started gossiping that I must be going back to WWE, that means. So I started I started uh, fanning those flames on my Twitter account <laughs> to try to throw people off as much as I could because I knew what was going to happen when I came back to TNA. I, I, I knew I was coming back to TNA, I should say. Like, I wasn't done with my contract. We just made it look like I was. Um, and Eric, I, I, I constantly would send these links to Eric saying, look, everybody's pretty much buying that. I'm going to WWE. So when the time's right to bring me back, we need to be playing off of this, that I no longer am an employee for TNA, yada, yada, yada. And uh, he would kind of halfway sell for it, you know, and be like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it or whatever, and then nothing would happen. And then... And I was like, you guys work so hard to create these storylines, and you guys claim you don't care about what the Internet says, but yet you're constantly contradicting yourself because you're writing for what the Internet is expecting. You know you are. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, they, I hear them say it all the time, like, oh, no one will ever see this comment, or no one will see this spoiler. Or, so you are technically writing for what the Internet thinks. You know, you're just too cool to admit it or whatever you want to say. So anyways, so... Here you have this one where everyone in the mother thinks I'm going to WWE, you know, for sure. Like, your start date, everything. Um, <laughs> I remember they came out with this WWE video game that nobody knew that it was a video game. It was just this viral campaign. And for some reason, they showed, like, this fast glimpse of me on this speed reel of, like, 50 different wrestlers that they show super quick. And I still to this day don't even know why I was on it, but I was somehow. And all these fans made, started fanning those flames. Like, he must be definitely coming. He does that Morgan, you know? And um, anyways, so you, you can't pay for that kind of, I don't know if it was trickery or work or whatever. But here the our competition is helping me, you know, mm-hmm. um, in that regard. Um, not on purpose, but they technically are, right? All the fans are buying it. So um, anyways, it's time to go back. And I, I'm starting to call them going, all right, when are we going? I'm getting super bored here. Like, this has been plenty long enough. I'm like, okay, we're going to have you come back to Bound for Glory. All right, cool. So at first I'm thinking I'm going to come back to Bound for Glory. I'm going to be the end up being the role that ends up being for Devon, if you remember, um, where he was the one that, I guess, you know, with the whole, um, what was it? What was the biker group called? Oh, the Aces and Eights. Aces, Aces and Eights. Yeah. 
I thought for sure that must, no one said it to me, but I, it just made sense. If you're going to be back to a big role, that would be the role. And maybe that was the truth. I don't know. No one ever said it to me, though, so I shouldn't say that. So I come back, and they're like, yeah, we want you to tag with Joey Ryan, and da, da, da. I'm friends with Joey. I'm actually really good friends with Joey Ryan. I think the world of him, and he's a hell of a talent that has been totally misutilized, but that's a whole other story. So anyways, I... I get back to Don for Boy, and they're telling me that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to be helping him beat Al Snow, and then from there, me and Joey are going to be a thing. We're going to be together, grouped up, linked at the hip. And I'm going, well, you got to be shitting me. Like, this is what I set out for in my prime? I'm in my prime right now. I'm 70, 300 pounds. You know how many 7 foot 300 pound guys can't stay injury free for more than two days, let alone months? You know, I've never had the injury bug hit me in wrestling, but, like, you're asking for it by having me sit out all this time and not be in a wrestling ring, you know? And and we took that risk, and here I'm back, and that's what you put me in? You know, so I was, I was kind of heated about it, and I made I made it known. I was very honest about it. I pulled, I pulled Hulk aside, and I go, what is this shit? And he agreed with me. And he goes, I have no idea. I, I That's not what it was supposed to be kind of a thing. He goes, but then again, they never really told me what it was going to be. And, uh... So I was like, I don't want to bury too much because here I'm friends with Joey, and this is a friend. This is a good opportunity for him too, you know. <laughs> so it was one of those deals where I'm like, screw it, I'll make the most of it. Hulk was like, if I have anything to do with it, I will try to do everything I can on the side with you and make them see that they should be doing something a lot more with you. And he did. Any type of prepackaged, uh, or prepackaged, any of those pre tapes you ever saw me talking shit on Hogan and bullying him and everything like that, they didn't write that shit. That was Hulk going to bat for him for me. And saying, hey, you know, and they want to get Hulk on TV as much as possible. We know that. So, right. <laughs> you know, here's a situation where Hulk saw, you know, money in me, and he was always trying to help me. And he was like, let's, let, here, let me, guys, if you, if this is the best what you have for, for what you have from Matt Morgan, let's do this as well. Okay. Let, let me do this with, let me do a pre-tape with him and Joey and yada, yada, yada. And so they'd be like, oh, okay, Hulk, whatever. Even though he has nothing to do with creative. They'd be like, oh, okay, and then go along with it. And thank God, because at least I had that. You know, at least I had this guy going to bat for me and seeing money in me and whatever. Right? It was a lot better than what they had planned, because what they had planned was very, very loose and very, very um, nondescript and no structure to it whatsoever. You know? And I was, I was heated about it. I really, really was. Because when, before I had left, I'm the guy that took Kurt Angle, Bell to Bell, Bell for Glory. I had the entire arena cha- next world champ, even though I just lost. And we did almost a double uh, change that night, a double uh, switch. And that's hard to do versus Kurt Angle. With the entire beginning of the match, they're cheering for Kurt. And um, I'm supposed to be the heel. Then they switch it to, you know, they switch mid-match for me out of respect because I just want 25 minutes versus the greatest in the world and look like I belonged. From that moment on, the work was done. The hardest part of the job should have been completed and done. I had arrived. End of story. You know what I mean? But no, they, they, they just never had a contingency plan in place for that next step of getting the guy to the final finish line. Not just me, all of our guys. Samoa Joe could probably preach this story to you guys 16 times for his own career. At TNA. <laughs> you know, same with AJ, same with a bunch of guys, you know, but that's, that's just my particular one. So again, that's what happened with me, like me and tagging with Joey. And it was kind of a contradiction with eventually what would happen because Hulk kept pressing for me to go off by myself, and Eric would kind of be like, yeah, but we really like him with Joey, and Joey's really good, and all this other stuff, and um, it was a complete contradiction, and me and Joey are kind of caught in the middle, you know, so what do you do? You just do the best you can with what you're given, and um, so that was pretty much it, and then eventually, I guess it kind of won out because I started going my own direction, and I was going to be wrestling Sting in this angle where I was told I'd be the, I, I would be the one that would eventually retire him. And uh, I was excited for that. Sting, I know, wanted that as well. And um, he's a guy that worked a bunch of times already, so he knew he's safe with me out there in the ring. And he believed in me as well, you know. So I had everybody's blessing, but the, no offense to the rating team, but the least important of the people that should should really matter. You know what I mean? It should ma- It should be up to the, the, a star like Sting or Hulk Hogan or guys that have made money in his business and know what work. You know, more, more so than a creative team that, no offense, had at this point not even been there for a few months because it, it did change by this point. So, again... This is the, <clears throat> the Undisputed Wrestling right. Show. We're talking to Blueprint Matt Morgan. Um, 
to your point, Matt, the, the most insane thing for a fan who's watching TNA wrestling is seeing storylines developed and never come to fruition. It just gets dropped in the middle of a program without any rhyme or reason or without any ending to it. And it seemed like it happened a lot to you, you know, yes. especially there at the end with Sting. And then you got you got pulled up to, you know, do a storyline with Hulk Hogan in the robe. Hulk Hogan yep. the WrestleMania robe and all that. I teased you a little bit about Twitter over hey, that. Hey, guys, but, hey, guys, as crazy as you might think that robe story was, that's him again, throwing Hulk throwing me a bone and, and doing anything he can to be involved in my angle to help me. Okay, I like so that. that was, I, I was just that, wanting that, to that see that it. Wasn't our I just wanted to see it through. <laughs> that, yeah, again, that wasn't our creative team's idea. That's his idea. You know, the creative team used to be, uh, was, was fantastic to me. Don't get me wrong, over the years. And over the long haul, they were fantastic to me. It was just toward the end, it got too murky. Where we had Bruce Pritchard, we had Eric, we had David Lugana, we had Matt Conway. We had too many cooks, way too many cooks. We had Vince on his way out at the time, way too many cooks. Um, but I gotta be honest, Vince, when Vince was, when it was just Vince as the head of creative, that, in my opinion, was my best body of work on how I was being presented. That was the whole angle versus Kurt Angle. That was almost an entire year run to get to that match at Bound for Glory versus him. You know, a lot of times he gets criticized for short arming match, uh, short arming uh, angles and, and or, or shotgunning, I should say, and like you know putting the you know putting the clamp on it too quick before it develops and things like that. That was an, almost an entire year run of a match. I mean, of an angle to lead to that match, I should say. Um, that was done perfectly. Me versus the main event mafia. That's probably my favorite storyline I've done. Uh, then obviously, you know, for being a little eight year old in me, me versus Hulk Hogan, that part, that was fantastic. Of course, <laughs> plus behind the scenes of how hard he was fighting for me made it all the more better. 